Ignition. When you're living in a world where nuclear weapons exist, Lift off. things can be tense. But when you have two rivals that deeply distrust one another, like the USA and the USSR, and when they both have their own nuclear weapon arsenal, that's a recipe for a Cold War. The Cold War filled people all over the world with an increasingly credible existential fear that they might experience nuclear fallout. And it doesn't help that by the early 1960s, the United States and the Soviets had developed nuclear bombs exponentially stronger and more destructive than the ones used to destroy Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But there's a reason these new weapons of mass destruction haven't been used in combat. And the reason is mad. After 1949, when the Soviet Union detonates its first atomic bomb, the superpowers settle into what people often refer to as mutually assured destruction, which has the very unfortunate but maybe accurate acronym MAD. And the basic idea of MAD was that the fact that each one of the superpowers had nuclear weapons would serve as a check on the other one using them. Imagine we see two cowboys in a standoff like that iconic scene from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Only imagine that instead of normal guns, these weapons can unleash nearly unimaginable destruction, the type that could destroy the entire planet. You might think that having the first shot is the automatic advantage, but when you're talking about nuclear weapons, that would mean a whole incredible amount of destruction. In order to keep from going nuclear, Planning on both sides was motivated by an attempt to make the other side believe that they were serious about starting a nuclear war. The two cowboys in that situation have pistols pointed at one another's heads. Neither is going to fire, right? Because the risk is too high. That's essentially the idea of mutually assured destruction was that because each side could be destroyed by the other, that they would deter both powers from actually using these weapons in an act of war. MAD is a tightrope balancing act. And with the amount of firepower both the US and USSR were packing, all it could take was one misstep, one miscommunication to set the world spiraling into nuclear war. Over 13 days in 1962, a wild idea brought the Soviet Union led by Nikita Khrushchev and the United States, led by John F. Kennedy, into a dangerous standoff that had the whole world wondering who was going to pull the trigger first. It's 1959, and the Soviet Union is under new dictatorship. I mean, new leadership. Nikita Khrushchev is a former scrappy metal worker and current scrappy veteran politician who, despite serving as Stalin's right-hand man during his rule, now embarks on a program of de-Stalinization after Uncle Joe dies. In the United States, a rising star adds some much-needed handsomeness to the United States Senate, John F. Kennedy. More than just a pretty face, Kennedy was born and bred for power. The son of a diplomat and graduate of Harvard University, he is as preppy as a private yacht, even though he sailed torpedo boats in the Navy. On an official visit from New York, Khrushchev meets with several American lawmakers, including the young Kennedy. They both started in politics young, but that might be where the comparisons end. Khrushchev had no more than two, at most three years, a formal education in a not very good church school. As a result of this, he was highly uncultured and about as different from John Kennedy as one could possibly imagine. Both men underestimate each other from the outset. Despite Kennedy's pedigreed background, or perhaps because of it, Khrushchev is unimpressed when Kennedy rolls in late for their meeting. Later, Khrushchev observes that Kennedy is, and I quote, too young to be a U.S. senator, 
as Michael Scott once said. Boom. Roasted. <laughs> Kennedy on his end notices that Khrushchev, a Russian, drank a lot of vodka. A keen observation that only a Harvard graduate could make. At the time, the Soviets have been kicking the United States butts in the space race. They already successfully launched the first artificial satellite, the first spacecraft to reach the surface of the moon, and the first animal to orbit Earth. Although, unfortunately, Laika died in the process. Some American leaders start to worry that the Soviets are beating the U.S. in the nuclear arms race as well. Kennedy gives a speech in 1958 where he trots out this idea that the Soviets are building more missiles than we are, we're about to lose our technological superiority. I don't think he really expects that it's going to go anywhere. But in fact, there is a response, a powerful response in the Senate to that notion. So what does he do? He says, I'm going to start using this on the campaign trail. So for the next two years, he issues this argument that there's a missile gap, the Republicans are responsible for this. It could have calamitous effects for American national security. And if you elect me, I'm going to fix this. The funny thing is, there really was a missile gap. But it actually favored the United States, not the Soviet Union. So why was Kennedy claiming otherwise? Regardless, it was an election year. And it worked. Now, Kennedy has to prove himself as a world leader. One of his first missions is a covert attempt to overthrow the Cuban communist leader, Fidel Castro, who had seized control of the island nation in a revolution two years prior. During an attempted invasion at the Bay of Pigs, everything that can go wrong does go wrong. Planes miss targets, unseen coral reefs slow boats down, paratroopers land in the wrong place, and the U.S.-funded guerrilla army is immediately outmatched by Castro's forces. Instead of sending in the cavalry and blowing the U.S.'s cover, Kennedy lets it all play out. The Bay of Pigs invasion is a major embarrassment. Politically damaged, Kennedy needs a big win on the international stage. So, less than five months into his presidency, and a little more than two months after the Bay of Pigs invasion, the young president meets with Khrushchev in Vienna. Kennedy hoped to use the Vienna summit to get to know Khrushchev. Kennedy was, I think, confident in his ability as a younger man, as a more educated man. I think he was confident that he could take the measure of Khrushchev and if it came to it, uh, outduel him if it turned into an argument. In Vienna, Khrushchev and Kennedy greet one another at the American embassy. Eventually, they do get into a debate. And in it, Kennedy makes a dangerous statement. He says that the forces of the Soviet Union and the United States are more or less balanced. It mattered a lot to Khrushchev that the Soviet Union be seen by American leaders as strong. He had gone so far as to pretend to have missiles that he didn't have. He would said, we are turning out missiles like sausages, which wasn't true. So when Kennedy suddenly said, we are more or less equal. <laughs> Khrushchev thought, all my tricks have worked. To have the American president suddenly admit that the two sides were roughly equal was very empowering. Maybe even encouraging him to go on and try to intimidate Kennedy, if that's what Kennedy really thought. Step one, divide Berlin. Beginning with rows of barbed wire and later giant slabs of concrete, the wall cuts off West Berlin from East Berlin and East Germany while trapping two million West Berlin residents inside the Iron Curtain. With all eyes on the unfolding crisis in Berlin, Khrushchev wants to give Americans a taste of their own medicine. It's time for step two, install nukes in Cuba. In 1962, the United States possessed the ability to deliver hundreds of nuclear warheads via aircraft, had a large number of intercontinental ballistic missiles, and had shorter range missiles in half a dozen partner states across Europe. 
In addition, the United States had already put to sea its first effective ballistic missile submarine. In other words, the United States had a fully operable nuclear triad by the time the Cuban Missile Crisis began. By contrast, the Soviets had only a handful of reliable ICBMs, somewhere around 40 or so, and these were very slow to fuel up and launch. What that meant was that in the event of a nuclear war, from the perspective of Moscow in 1962, the United States would win. Up until this point, there had never been Soviet weapons so close to America. That's what makes Castro such an important ally to Khrushchev. If Khrushchev could install nuclear missiles in Cuba, he could protect Cuba from invasion. But most importantly, he could bring some balance to the nuclear dynamic. Brilliant. The Soviet operation to place missiles in Cuba was a crackpot scheme. That is the idea that you could send missiles and troops and launching pads across the open ocean and not be noticed, and that you could then land them in Cuba and trek them through the Cuban jungles and have nobody say, what the hell is going on? It was a harebrained scheme. Unfortunately for the Soviets, this scheme was as subtle as Khrushchev's vodka consumption. Kennedy's U-2 spy planes totally noticed. And on October 14, 1962, a U-2 flight confirms Kennedy's worst fears. That Soviets are installing missiles which, when operational, could not only reach but wipe out most American cities, including the nation's capital. National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy alerts President Kennedy of the situation. The president forms an exclusive clique of top advisors called XCOM to get a clear understanding of the threat. Oh, and conveniently for us, Kennedy had these meetings secretly taped. Uh, General, how long would you say we had uh, before these be ready to fire? These could be fully operational within two weeks. We've officially got a crisis on our hands, folks. And this one is known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Interestingly, Robert McNamara, who's the Secretary of Defense, basically says early in the missile crisis, it doesn't really matter in terms of the strategic balance if he's got these missiles in Cuba. Given what we have in Europe directed at Soviet targets, Kennedy basically says, well, that may be true, Mr. Secretary, but this is about perceptions. And we cannot allow the Soviet Union to have medium-range missiles pointed at American targets 90 miles from the coast of Florida. U.S. credibility on the world stage will be shattered. Two camps form in the president's inner circle. Those who want aggressive military action and those who are fighting for a diplomatic solution. To bomb or not to bomb? That is the question. On the diplomatic front, the United States can sit on its hands and do nothing. The U.S. can also negotiate with the Soviets to remove the missiles and even offer a side deal to Fidel Castro to split with the Russians. If they go the military route, the U.S. can launch a full-scale invasion of Cuba or a strategic airstrike to knock out the missile sites. Kennedy can also put the squeeze on Russia with a U.S. Navy blockade on Soviet ships carrying missiles to Cuba. What is a blockade? It's the equivalent of Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings saying... Kennedy, for the first day or two, is leaning strongly in favor of military action, probably in the form of airstrikes. But pretty quickly, Kennedy begins to shift course and to say, we got to try to find a political solution to this. The American people learn about the situation from a measured television address. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. Hold up. Did he just say quarantine? We know that when Kennedy announced that there were Soviet missiles in Cuba, 
that Khrushchev was actually encouraged. He took the fact that Kennedy didn't even use the word blockade, because that would be an act of war, but rather used the word quarantine of Cuba. He took this as a further sign of Kennedy's weakness, that he could push and Kennedy would retreat. The word quarantine does not fool the Soviets. Khrushchev proceeds to press Kennedy, writing, you, Mr. President, are not declaring a quarantine, but are rather setting forth an ultimatum and threatening that if we do not give in to your demands, you will use force. We will then be forced on our part to take the measures we consider necessary and adequate in order to protect our rights. We have everything necessary to do so. Well, that is the exact opposite of what Kennedy wants to hear. Following Kennedy's speech, U.S. armed forces are ordered to DEFCON 3, an advanced state of readiness for war. Thousands of Marines are placed on standby as Kennedy and XCOM debate whether or not to invade Cuba. Then, U-2 flights over Cuba reveal that time is running out. Soviet missile sites are nearing operational readiness. On October 24, 1962, the United States Strategic Air Command is ordered to DEFCON 2, just one step away from nuclear war. This is the first and only time this has ever happened. The world is on the brink, and everything is complicated by the fact that it is so difficult for the two parties to communicate. There's no telephone, only telegrams and passive-aggressive or aggressive-aggressive television and radio addresses. Communication is slow, and it's bad. As negotiations between Kennedy and Khrushchev move at a glacial pace, American nuclear bombers take to the skies, awaiting orders to strike. The Soviet Union matches America's readiness and places its military on the highest alert. Meanwhile in Cuba, Castro's forces are working day and night, digging trenches in the sands in case American forces invade. But in the Atlantic Ocean, a few Russian ships show no sign that they'll respect the 805-kilometer quarantine line. Unbeknownst to the Americans at the time, the ships were guarded by submerged nuclear-armed submarines. The possibility of nuclear war is becoming more and more likely with each passing hour. So in 1962, I was a young man just married, living in my home city of Kansas City, Missouri. normal life, no children yet. And then this shocking, shocking news of the potential end of the human world, that there might be a nuclear exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union. We knew enough about nuclear weapons. We knew it from the end of the Second World War, just a few years earlier. It's hard to describe just how frightening, how deeply, existentially frightening that week was. We were truly terrified. One of the things that Kennedy had described later was standing on the balcony at the White House looking out over Washington and thinking, is this where it all ends? It's now October 27, 1962, a day that is known as Black Saturday. Kennedy is informed by his advisors that a Soviet submarine has been spotted in the waters near the quarantine line. Back in Washington, Kennedy's military advisors demand that the president hit back. But he decides against it. All the while, both Khrushchev and Kennedy are trying to stay in close contact. The fact that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it would take eight hours to get a message translated in Moscow and sent to Washington meant that that itself could have been the trigger for war. You know, you're waiting to hear from him, you don't hear from him. What's going on? Maybe it's a trap. Eventually, Khrushchev cables the White House with a 3,000-word message, which essentially says, Khrushchev will remove all missiles from Cuba if the Americans propose not to attack or invade Cuba. 
The next day, another message arrives saying, oh, and one more thing, I demand you remove your missiles from Turkey. Whoa. Well, the first letter, it was something he had dictated himself and the people in Washington who read it sensed that it was Khrushchev, not a speechwriter. It was emotional, it was agitated. He was afraid, he was nervous. When he sent another message the next day, adding another demand, it was much more a committee product and the people who received Khrushchev's message could tell it. How can we negotiate with somebody who changes the deal uh, before we even get a chance to reply and announce it publicly the deal before we receive it? I think we have to assume that this is their new and latest position at a public home. He's got us in a pretty good spot here. Well, most of the people think it's the route to the trade they're taking advantage of. And the ship is still. A few hours later, Kennedy receives news that an American U-2 plane attempting a surveillance flight over Cuba is shot down. I may term it this. I, I know I'm not going to interview, but I just don't see any other solution except direct military intervention right now. From a military point of view, the lowest risk course of action is the full gamut of military action by us. John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, was basically alone among his advisors in insisting on a political solution late in the crisis. Kennedy resists the pressure and says to his advisors, we can't do this. Not in the nuclear age. He also says, we have to look at this from Khrushchev's perspective. And he tells his advisors that they've got to do the same thing. That's amazing. Kennedy pledges that the United States will not invade Cuba in exchange for the Soviet missiles being withdrawn from Cuba. And for the first time in the crisis, he uses the communication gap to his advantage. Kennedy only publicly responds to the first proposal. The following morning, Nikita Khrushchev delivers his response live on Radio Moscow. Dear Mr. President, I have received your message of October 27th. I express my satisfaction and thank you for the sense of proportion you have displayed and for realization of the responsibility which now devolves on you for the preservation of the peace of the world. That final morning, Kennedy is getting dressed for mass when he is notified that Khrushchev is standing down. Upon hearing the news, his brother Bobby drives directly to the White House. Both men quietly rejoice. Hold up. What about the second proposal? You know, the one where the Soviets demanded the U.S. remove their missiles in Turkey? Well, privately, so privately, in fact, that not even his vice president knew. Kennedy makes a deal. The Jupiter missiles are removed a few months later, but the nature of this agreement is actually not disclosed until about 25 years ago. To the American people, Kennedy successfully has his cake and eats it too. In Cuba, Fidel Castro is outraged by Khrushchev's decision. Reports say that he literally kicks in a wall and punches a mirror in anger. The crisis is finally over. Following the intensity of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy and Khrushchev work on their communication issues. No, not through therapy, but through ordering the installation of a special wire circuit stretching over 16,000 kilometers from Washington, D.C., all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to Moscow. However, the happy couple's honeymoon bliss ends abruptly. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something I by the next year, Kennedy is killed by an assassin's bullet in Dallas. And not too long after, Khrushchev is removed from office by his rivals inside the Kremlin in October 1964. For the United States and the Soviet Union, the Cold War will now shift from the beaches of Cuba to the jungles of Vietnam. While the Soviet Union is as determined as ever to catch up to America's nuclear stockpile, and it's only a matter of time before another communist nation develops nuclear weapons of their own. <laughs> 